This could be the world by the end of this century, post-global warming. The ice caps have melted. Sea levels have risen around 70 meters, or 230 feet. Vast areas of land, as you can see here, are underwater, including capital cities like London, Berlin, Stockholm, Tokyo, Beijing, and other major cities like New York, Venice, Shanghai. Entire states and countries all but disappearing from the map. Bangladesh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Florida. Hundreds of millions of people on the move, many of them being relocated perhaps to a, a neighborhood near you. Massive expansion of deserts, the mass extinction of plant and animal species, and a complete breakdown in agriculture as crops that we've grown for thousands of years can no longer be grown in the same locations. And all of this within my lifetime, potentially, and that of many of us here, or if not, at the very least, our children. The cause of global warming is an increase in certain gases in the atmosphere that retain heat. Over 90% of the problem is two carbon-based gases, methane and carbon dioxide, CO2. The big news story of 2019 is the Amazon being on fire with vast amounts of CO2 being released into the atmosphere. Governments around the world have agreed to reduce CO2 emissions by 80% by 2050 in order to minimize the damage. But the policies and measures that they've put in place so far don't look like they're going to reduce the carbon emissions fast enough to meet that target. So, you can see why I get so many invites to parties, can't you? I bring my slides out and lift the mood, really cheer everybody up, you know. <coughs> but there is some good news. The good news is we can change this future. Climate catastrophe is not preordained. It is preventable if we adopt a low-carbon lifestyle. We can reduce our carbon emissions by 80% without waiting for governments or corporations to take any actions themselves. And today, I'm going to show you how. By introducing you to two individuals, Mr. Smoke and Mr. Smart. Now, both Mr. Smoke and Mr. Smart, they live next door to each other, and they have a fairly typical carbon footprint, which is around 12 tonnes per person per year. That's the total amount of carbon dioxide and equivalent gases going into the atmosphere as a result of all of their uh, decisions and purchases. Now, what does a ton of carbon dioxide look like? Well, if we were to take a, a large three-bedroom detached house and around 200 square meters of floor area, fill the whole house and the whole roof, pitch roof, with carbon dioxide, that would weigh one ton. And here we have our couple. They have 12 tons each going into the atmosphere. The footprint actually breaks down into five categories. So let's look at each category in turn. And the first category is electricity, where we have two uh, tons per person per year. And this is what both Mr. Smoke and Mr. Smart started out with, carbon footprint of two tons. But Mr. Smart managed to completely eliminate his carbon footprint. He took three measures, the first of which is he changed all of his lighting over to LEDs. LEDs is one of those technologies that's progressed a great deal in the last five years. There's been huge improvements. And when you invest in LEDs, very often the, uh, the savings will pay for themselves, often within two or three years, as they did here with Mr. Smart. Mr. Smoke, on the other hand, did purchase some LEDs, but he keeps them in a drawer for emergencies. So he didn't actually realize the saving. He invested in something and didn't actually realize the saving. Mr. Smart installed the LEDs straight away, and he keeps the old lighting in the drawer for emergencies. The second measure Mr. Smart took was he uh, gradually, as it came time to replace each of his electrical appliances, he chose the most energy-efficient appliances that he could. And the LED measure saved around half a ton 
of carbon, carbon dioxide and the appliances saved another half a ton. That's half a house full of CO2. And the final measure that Mr. Smart took was that he switched to a 100% renewable electricity supply. And this completely removed the rest of his carbon footprint. In many countries now, we can make a choice like that. The surprising thing was that he was expecting it to cost more, and it actually didn't. It actually cost less. The second major category is heat. And heat we ha is a typical carbon footprint. depends where you are in the world and so on, but a typical carbon footprint would be around two and a half houses full of CO2, two and a half tonnes per person per year. And as we can see here, Mr. Smart managed to reduce that to around half a tonne. And again, he took three measures that achieved this. The first was that he installed smart controls. Again, heating and cooling controls have pro progressed so much in the last five years uh, that the uh, savings can be very, very fast. And again, an investment can pay back within two, three, four years or so. And uh, that can save 10, 20, or sometimes even 30% from a heating bill or even a cooling bill without you even trying. The second measure is that Mr. Smart realized he had an old heating system. It was more than 20 years old, so he decided to replace it with a modern, more efficient system. In many cases, oil and gas boilers more than 20 years old uh, can be burning 30% more than they need to. The smart controls saved around half a tonne, and the replacement heating system saved another half a tonne. That's half a house. And then the final measure that Mr. Smart took saved a whole tonne per year of CO2, and that was that he insulated his home, he insulated the roof, he insulated the walls, he insulated his hot water cylinder. Insulation acts as a heat barrier, so uh, it slows down the transfer of heat from uh, warm places to cold places. Um, so all buildings, including homes, the more insulation you have, the slower they will take to cool down. If it's the winter time and it's cold outside, the building will retain more heat. Uh, and in the summertime, if it's hot outside and you're cooling the building, more insulation is, is beneficial because it will slow down the heat ingress into the building. So that means less work for your heating and cooling system to do. And that saves another ton, another house full of CO2. The next category is transport. And a fairly typical sort of carbon footprint for transport would be around two tons per person per year. And as you can see here, Mr. Smoke has two tons, and that includes one uh, foreign flight per year for a holiday and a certain amount of travelling around by car and commuting. Uh, Mr. Smart started off with the same carbon footprint, but he managed to reduce that from two tons to half a ton. He decided instead of flying every year that he would fly once every five years instead, and he decided to switch his annual holiday from a flying holiday to a holiday by train, and that saved a whole ton. And the other measure he took was that he shifted some of his uh, traveling needs, some of his journeys from his uh, car to uh, buses, trains, cycling and walking, public transport and so on, and that saved another half a ton or so. The other thing Mr. Smart did, uh, which uh, is not included in these figures, but the other thing he did is when it came time to replace his oil burning uh, engine based vehicle, he actually decided to uh, choose a vehicle with a plug. So he chose a, a hybrid electric or, hy uh, or full electric vehicle. Now, you might be thinking, why does that make a difference? Isn't it as bad to be burning coal in power stations as it is to be burning oil in vehicles? Well, 50 years ago, that was true. But in the last 50 years, electrical grids have shifted hugely from burning coal towards burning natural gas. And natural gas is much cleaner, much less carbon intensive. And of course, what's happening now is that electrical grids are also shifting more and more to zero carbon sources such as renewables. So they're getting cleaner and cleaner all the time. The next area is stuff. This is the industrial and commercial uh, emissions which are generated as a result of the products that we buy, the furniture, the clothes, the electricals, the home improvements and so on. And a typical carbon footprint uh, in uh, UK, Europe and China, for example, would be around two tonnes per person per year. That's the buying of the stuff and the disposing of the stuff at the end. The full tonnage of your 
uh, carbon footprint from stuff may not be included in your country's national uh, figures because we import a great deal of products. Many countries do, and that if we import products, then we're exporting carbon footprint. So this is taken as a whole across the world. So the average is two tons. Mr. Smart decided to reduce his to one ton. And there were two very simple measures that he took. The first was that he decided to reduce the amount of new things that he buys by one third. He embraced minimalism, which is simply buying stuff only when you need to. That saved around half a ton or so. He buys more things second hand, online auction sites, charity shops and so on. So many of us have heard the mantra, reduce, reuse, recycle. So he reduced the amount of stuff that he, he bought, he reused more, and the third step was, and this saved the other half a ton in this category, was he increased the amount of recycling. Now, Mr. Smoke and Mr. Smart, they both live next door to each other, and their local authority collects three types of waste. They collect uh, food and garden waste for composting. They collect uh, a lot of recyclables like metal, glass, uh, some plastics, cardboard and paper. And they collect general waste as well. Uh, Mr. Smoke um, has a bin in his kitchen. He throws everything into one bin and he decides that he's going to separate the uh, wastes later. And when it comes time to take out the rubbish once a week, uh, Mr. Smoke, uh, it's very often late, he may be tired, uh, it may be dark outside. Uh, he takes out his rubbish and he says, I'm sure I wanted to do some separation of wastes here. No, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to throw it all in the general waste. Mr. Smart, on the other hand, put three separate bins in his kitchen, one for each type of waste, and he got into the habit of separating his wastes at source. And that saves, in this case, around half a tonne per year. And then the final category is food. And this is a whopping three and a half tons per person per year. Mr. Smart reduced this to half a ton. How did he do this? Well, he took one measure only. <coughs> he adopted a plant-based diet. Now, what does a plant-based diet mean? It simply means he found cheap, tasty alternatives to meat, fish, eggs, and dairy products. Now, why does this make such a difference? Why is this so powerful? Three tons of saving? Well, to feed an average human to around 2,000 calories per day on purely plants, farmers need to grow between two and 3,000 calories per day of crops. But to feed an average human 2,000 calories per day on animal products, we have to grow somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 calories per day of crops. And most of that is then lost as movement, manure, and methane. Because cows and sheep, ruminant animals, uh, they uh, generate a lot of methane, as we know, which is itself a very powerful greenhouse gas. So most of the calories, most of the crops that are grown for the animals are, in fact, wasted. If we look at the whole world, to feed 7.5 billion humans on plants alone, we would need around 7% of the land mass of the planet. Now, that's distributed all over the world. But if we were to put it in one place, 7% of the land mass of the planet is roughly the area of Europe. We're currently using 38% of the land mass of the planet for agriculture. That's an area the size of Europe and Asia combined. Every single acre, every single hectare of land requires energy. Energy to plant crops, energy to uh, fertilize crops, and energy to harvest them. And because the world population is expanding, that area is expanding. And this is why Amazon rainforest, the Indonesian rainforest, are being cleared at the moment. It's, it's to feed the growing requirement that we have. And 91% of that deforestation is, is caused by farmers and ranchers, uh, and it's being done for food. It's caused by the animal agriculture industry. Out of this carbon footprint, this three and a half tons, two tons per person, per year, is simply deforestation. It's been calculated that each person who goes plant-based saves around 1,000 square meters of rainforest per year. So in seven years, that's a whole football field. To stop the Amazon burning, this is the only weapon we need, the money in our pockets. 
So, how did Mr. Smart go plant-based? Well, he tried lots of uh, interesting and tasty alternatives to uh, meat and fish and so on. He found a nice plant-based milk that he liked. Um, this is just oat milk, soy milk, rice milk, and so on. But he had a problem because he was addicted to cheese. Now, who here has a cheese addiction? Okay, that's at least a third of the room. Okay, so Mr. Smart tried lots of different plant-based cheeses. Do you know what? Most of them were awful. But he persisted, and eventually he found one that he liked. It wasn't the same as uh, his friends liked, but he did eventually find one that he, he liked. Does going plant-based cost more? No, not at all. Everywhere in the world that you go, the cheapest source of calories is a starchy plant-based staple. Rice, bread, pasta, oats, potatoes. To seriously reduce our carbon footprint, we have to make a radical shift towards a plant-based diet. So in summary, we can achieve an 80% saving in our carbon footprint by adopting a low-carbon lifestyle. Many of the steps that we need to take towards this can be done immediately. Some take a little bit longer. All of these measures, or nearly all of these measures, actually save money, either immediately or in a two to five year period of time. Can we get from an 80% saving all the way to 100%? Can we go zero carbon? Well, yes, we can, but that's where we do need governments and corporations to take action. There are several ways of doing this. The simplest way is simply for governments to ensure that there's a surplus of zero carbon electricity that's produced and to store that surplus as fuels. Synthetic fuels, for example, synthetic aviation fuels, and also as hydrogen. And then the mains gas network can be converted over to hydrogen in the long term. So, what next? I invite you to join me in living a low-carbon lifestyle. We can copy Mr. Smart. Take at least one action today in that direction. Focus on the actions that you can do straight away, not necessarily the ones which you can't do until later. Copy this video to people that you know so that they can take one or more of these actions too. Together, we can prevent climate catastrophe. Now you know how. The power is in your hands. <laughs>